Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Wednesday, September 21st, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, the death of American culture. Barack Obama tells the UN that America must give up liberty for security. Meanwhile, the administration continues to allow wave after wave of Muslim refugees into the country, ignoring military and intelligence reports that warn of the Trojan horse disguised as a Muslim refugee. Plus, Hillary Clinton feeds the race war as she jumps to conclusions on Twitter and riots begin in Charlotte. It's a protest. I don't want to call it a standoff with police, but protests are spreading after an officer today shot and killed an African-American man who police say was on. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Today, Sheriff Arpaio said he is going to continue to investigate the birth certificate of Barack Obama. He said, I'm not going to give up. He said, I don't care where he's from. It is a forged document period. Folks, Obama came in with a deception. We didn't know who this guy was. He was lying about uh, so many things. He had a hidden agenda. Today, we're going to take a look at Obama as he leaves. He laid out his legacy, his last eight years before the UN today, and we're going to look at it. It's got a lot of layers, just like his birth certificate. <laughs> we're going to see what he has forged these last eight years. Now, today, he went before the UN, he told the group, he says, uh, as I address you for the final time as president, I'm sure he will be back in some capacity at the UN because he's already had another capacity that he held simultaneously with being the president. One of the interesting things he had, he says, we're going to look at the progress that we've made these last eight years. And when he says we, he means the globalist government because this entire speech is from the perspective of a globalist. Some of his accomplishments, he says, we've taken away terrorist safe havens, and we have resolved the Iranian nuclear issue. Seriously, we have taken away terrorist safe havens. He has set the Middle East on fire. He's created a terrorist arms bazaar in Libya, deposing a regime that posed no threat to us or anyone else. And then he has resolved the Iranian nuclear issue. No, he has revived the Iranian nuclear issue with a massive money laundering scheme, uh, billions, actually uh, billions sit in cash on a secret plane, foreign currency that he brought in. But let's look at what else he has to say, because the next thing that he goes to, I think is very telling. He says, we've made international institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund more representative. He doesn't support that. But do you really believe that the IMF is more representative? We've had the IMF now holding a gun to the head of Greece, demanding that they change their government. And we've seen in the last eight years, the IMF and other institutions deposing democratically elected representatives in Greece and Italy, putting in bankers in their place. But I think it's very interesting that he takes the World Bank and the IMF, two of the key instruments of the globalist multinational fascists that are taking over democracies, and he uses them in the same juxtaposition saying, while we establish a framework to protect our planet from the ravages of climate change. You see, that is the model for what they're going to do with climate change. They're going to have these non-controllable, non-democratic institutions like the IMF and the World Bank that are going to literally be banks for the multinational corporatists who wrote the Trans-Pacific, the Transatlantic Treaties, who wrote the Climate Change Treaty. Those are the pillars for world government. The Climate Change Treaty is how they are going to establish the authority and the funding for world government. And we'll see that further on in his speech. He says, we're seeing the same forces of global integration that have made us interdependent also expose deep fault lines in the existing international order. Yes. We have seen the European Union talk about this, the president of the European Union, just talk about galloping nationalism and how it presents an existential threat to the European Union. They know that people are waking up. They know that we see what they're doing. The question is, will we act collectively to stop this takeover? They say, he says, refugees are flowing across the border. Here's some of the problems that you all understand, and they're going to uh, enumerate these problems so that you think that they're with you 
that they see them as problems. They don't see them as problems. They see them as tools to do what they want, which is to further consolidate the global government. He says refugees flow across borders. Financial disruptions continue to weigh upon our workers and entire communities. Across vast swaths of the Middle East, basic security, basic order has broken down. All these things are true, but that's by their design. He said we see too many governments muzzling journalists. Oh, you mean like Barack Obama has done with the 1917 Espionage Act? Prosecuting more journalists in his term, as a matter of fact, three times more people, whistleblowers and journalists, than all the other presidents in the previous 100 years combined. That's precisely what he's been doing. Quashing dissent, he says. That's precisely what he's been doing. Censoring the flow of information, which is what they are attempting to do with control of the Internet. And then he goes on to make a very interesting statement. Powerful nations contest the constraints placed on them by international law. That says everything. So we are chafing under the tyranny of an international law, an international law that you have absolutely no control over. You don't have any democratic representation in this international law any more than you have any democratic representation in these treaties that are going to control our economies. That is the fundamental issue before us. He says, but nevertheless, we must go forward into more globalism and not backwards. He says we need to integrate our global economy because it has made life better for billions of men and women and children over the last 25 years. And he goes on to put out a uh, statistic that I don't believe is true. He doesn't support it. We're going to fact check some of the statistics. We're not going to fact check this one. He says over the last 25 years, people living in extreme poverty have been cut from nearly 40% of humanity to under 10% of humanity. Okay. I think that figure is just as phony as the unemployment figure that he gives for the U.S. economy. That one is very easy to fact check. And what he's telling us here is that even though he goes to Africa and tells the people there, you, you guys can't have air conditioning. I mean, the planet would explode. <laughs> that type of thing. That's his compassion for the people in developing countries. He goes on to say, cracking the genetic code promises to cure diseases that have plagued us for centuries. That might be a little bit troubling, but let's go on with the economics that he says and the, politi uh, the politics he says. In remote corners of the world, Obama says, citizens are demanding respect for the dignity of all people, no matter their gender, race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, and those who deny others dignity are subject to public reproach. That essentially is the legacy of the Obama administration as we see today. The Navy becoming the center for transgender promotion within the military. And that is what he has focused on, because that has become an instrument of division within the communities. He goes on to talk about the end of the Cold War has lifted the shadow of nuclear Armageddon, yet they have put this back on. They have revived the Cold War under Obama, and yet he talks about the Cold War as if it were ended. He goes on to say China and India remain on a path of remarkable growth. But the bottom line is not America, folks, not America. He says to move forward, we have to acknowledge that the existing path to global integration. See, that's the key. They want global integration. He says in this document over and over again, he refers to global integration, global governance. And it is global governance by an unelected elite, even though he spends a great deal of time talking about democracy. He says it may require course correction. Those trumpeting the benefits of globalization have ignored the inequality within and among nations. He says we've left international institutions ill-equipped, underfunded, under-resourced in order to handle transnational challenges. Now, what are the problems, he says? The global problems are that the U.S. is still richer than other nations. That's what he just said. He said, we have ignored the inequality between nations. You understand, we're the ones that are going to be taken down to the level of other people. They're not going to be lifted to our level. This is a leveling socialism that they are selling us. We've already seen it for the last 25 years with NAFTA and these other trade agreements. They're going to lower us. They will lift the other countries somewhat, but they will lower us by a massive amount. So that's how they're going to take care of the inequality between nations. And then he said the problem is that they have global institutions that are ill-equipped and underfunded. Where's that money going to come from? It's going to come from us. They're going to tax us. And it's going to be done for transnational challenges. See, he's just talking about his dream of transgenders, even controlling our restrooms. Now, what is really behind this, folks, there's a different kinds of, of training that he is selling. 
to keep you distracted from what they're doing at the global level. They're, they're getting us confused with gender. They're trying to control our restrooms, get us fighting amongst each other while they impose a transnational governance. That's what the trans-Pacific, the trans-Atlantic party, they're transcending all national borders. As the EU official said, borders are the worst invention ever. They believe that. He says, sometimes this opposition is coming from the far left. Sometimes it's coming from the far right. Now, they'll always paint it as extremists. But this is an acknowledgement from Obama that he is being opposed by people on both the left and the right. People on both the left and the right do not, do not like their globalism. He says, we cannot dismiss these visions. They're powerful. They reflect dissatisfaction among too many of our citizens. But he said, we don't want to have a nation that is ringed by walls. It would only imprison itself. Think about the irony of that. He talks about us imprisoning ourselves if we have a border, if we have some control. And the reality is, is that he has continued to preside over for eight years over a nation that has locked up more of its people than any other nation in history with a drug war. And we can do better. We can have a war on terrorism, too. We can lock up even more people, uh, more political dissidents, more journalists, more whistleblowers. That's the answer to everything in the Obama administration. But you want to talk about prison? You want to talk about controlling the borders, imprisoning people? It is our war on drugs that is imprisoning people. He says, so the simple answer cannot be a rejection of global integration. He said, let me offer some broad strokes that can make these things better. And then he contrasts North Korea with South Korea, talks about the failure of central planning. And yet he, contra he says that so that he can then attack capitalism as being soulless that it only benefits the few. And here's one of the big lies of this presentation that he has that I want to fact check. He says, these are the policies that I've pursued here in the United States in order uh, democracy and a, and a control over soulless capitalism. He said, American businesses have now created 15 million new jobs. Well, okay. If you look at the unemployment rate, there's an unemployment rate called the U6. And that's what we used to call the unemployment rate until they changed it under Clinton. They discontinued people who have discontinued to become discouraged and not looking for jobs or haven't been able to find a job in a certain period of time. If you're unemployed for a certain period of time, then you basically aren't in the workforce and they're not going to cover you anymore in the statistics they say. But if you cover the people who can't find jobs, if you cover the people who are underemployed, then you see that the true unemployment rate is nearly 10%. And if he says that we have created 15 million jobs, understand that a lot of those jobs are part-time jobs that are there because of the Obamacare mandates and people trying to escape full-time workers. And then he makes an incredible statement about the top 1% of Americans capturing more than 90% of income growth. He says, but today that's down to about half. No, that's not true. Take a look at income inequality, inequality.org. They say the United States income equality has been growing markedly by every major statistical measure for some 30 years. And they talk about the fact that it is not only, uh, it has accelerated in the last few years. They say it took a short dive after the troubles in 2007, 2008, but it is now back on course. And they say the biggest consolidations, the biggest inequality is at the top, 0.1%. They say inequality in America is growing even at the top. The nation's highest 0.1% of income earners have over recent decades seen their incomes rise much faster than even the rest of the top 1%, increasing by seven and a half times. That is the truth of what is being done to America. Now, I want to jump ahead to what he has to say about Islam. There's a lot of things that we could go over that we don't have time for. He says we must reject any forms of fundamentalism or racism or a belief in ethnic superiority. And yet, he talks to us then about his favorite thing, which is Islam. He says, it is a truthism that global integration has led to a collision of cultures, trade, migration, the Internet. All these things can challenge and unsettle our most cherished identities. And then he gives examples of what his most cherished identities are. He said, we see liberal societies express opposition when women choose to cover themselves. Hmm, you mean like with a burqa. We see protests responding to Western newspaper cartoons that caricature the prophet Muhammad. Praise be upon him, says Obama. Okay, he goes on to say, suggesting that somehow people who look different are corrupting the character of other countries. No, it's not that they look different. It's that they want a different form of government. 
That is why they are being brought here. They want to establish a theocracy. This is not about distinguishing between people because of their skin color or because of the way they look. It's about distinguishing between people and saying we don't want people here who have such a rabid hatred of people who don't share their religion and that they want to impose a religion through the legal system rather than having the kind of liberal democracy, as he would put it, that we've had for centuries. And then he sums it up. He says, across the region's conflicts, that's the Middle East, we have to insist that all parties recognize a common humanity and that nations end proxy wars that fuel disorder. Ah, but he has done both. He has fueled a proxy war and he has created disorder. And he has used that proxy war to bring disorder to the United States. And that's precisely what Hillary Clinton wants to continue. This article we have at InfoWars.com today, neither Hillary nor Obama condemn Wahhabist terror. Wayne Madsen points out that Clinton wants a 555% increase in Muslim immigration. And of course, that's just what she's saying before the election. And when you push back against this, you push back against the idea that we don't know who the people are that are being brought in. You get an amazing pushback from the left. Criticizing Donald Trump Jr. when he had the meme with the Skittles saying, uh, if I've got a bowl of Skittles and only three of them will kill you, will you still take a handful of that? Well, they came back and they criticized him for saying that. And yet at the same time, the Democrats are eating Skittles for show in the Congress. At the same time, we've got NPR criticizing uh, Donald Trump Jr. for using a meme that he doesn't own the photographic rights to. At the same time, all of that is happening. The State Department itself says that we can't vet these people. And the state of Texas is saying, we know that. That's why we're going to opt out of this in the future. That's the reality, folks. Stay with us. When we come back, we'll look at the riots in Charlotte. Well, as you've seen by now and as we've reported throughout the day, there are massive riots in Charlotte after another police shooting. But I want you to look at what Hillary Clinton did with this. Immediately, she tweeted out, another unarmed black man was shot in a police incident. You understand what she's doing here. She is using a dog whistle when she does this. Completely devoid of facts, not looking at the circumstances, not waiting for an investigation to be done. She tries to stoke the race war, and she did it successfully. She said, this should be intolerable. And you know, this all those intolerable people. What she is doing with this dog whistle is she's saying to black community, especially to Black Lives Matter followers, hey, it's those and irredeemable, intolerable, deplorable white people. Go get them. And that's precisely what they did. You know, she is throwing gasoline on a fire. As a matter of fact, she and Black Lives Matter have been going from incident to incident throwing Molotov cocktails. We need to have police that are controlled. We need to use police differently than they're being used. We need to have better training. We need to hold the police who do these types of things that are uh, unwarranted shootings or excessive use of force. We need to hold them responsible. But that's not what she's saying, especially when she jumps into this at this point with that kind of analysis. Because what really happened? Let's take a look at what Reuters, how they reported this. Man fatally shot by police in North Carolina had a gun, say authorities. But listen to what they said. It raises questions, this whole incident, they said, raises questions of racial bias. Now, they go down, and uh, racial bias in U.S. law enforcement. They go down and say, that in two paragraphs down, a black Charlotte Mecklenburg police officer killed Keith Scott. You understand? It raises questions of racial bias when a black man is shot dead by a black cop. So we need to go out and attack white people. That's what Hillary Clinton is doing. That is the narrative that Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Black Lives Matter, George Soros sell to the American people. As Paul Watson pointed out in his article with that title, he says, Scott exited the vehicle, according to authorities, armed with a firearm and posed an immediate deadly threat to the officers who subsequently fired their weapon, striking the subject that's a statement from the Mecklenburg Police Department. Black Lives Matter supporters insisted that Scott was disabled, that he was only carrying a book. Within hours, a mob of around 1,000 rioters began staging unrest, blocking Interstate 85, looting trucks before setting fire to their contents. One family said the mob threw rocks at the windshields of cars, shattering the glass. That can also kill people, folks. Let's understand. Wouldn't it be a good idea, if there is a dispute here about what's happening, that we don't immediately go out and start attacking people who don't even have anything to do with that incident. 
If the police are directly contradicting the narrative of Black Lives Matter, can we wait and get some video footage and actually see what's going on? No, not according to Hillary Clinton, because it doesn't suit her purposes. And then look at the way the media takes this. We have uh, Mark Barber from WSOC Channel 9 calling the protesters who are smashing through doors, uh, calling them protesters and not rioters. We have another journalist doing the same thing. Uh, Trey from WCNC says, protesters decided to smash my work vehicle van window. No, they're simply rioters. They're dangerous, out of control rioters. Call it what it is. And yet we have seen this time and again. But I want you to understand just how much contempt Hillary has for law enforcement and how she is trying to stoke this race war and really a war between black people and the police. Going back to the Democrat National Convention, if you remember, the police uh, union there in Philadelphia uh, said they were very angry with Hillary Clinton. They criticized her for inviting, that was immediately after there had been a shooting in Dallas where a uh, Black Lives Matter sympathizer had shot several cops. Uh, they criticized Hillary Clinton for having victims of police shootings there, but not having any victims of uh, the, the police victims who had been shot in Dallas prior to that. That was a narrative about five days before the convention. And again, when I talked to Jesse Jackson on the floor of the convention, I asked him about that. And he goes, oh, yeah, I guess after he uh, threw some... Uh, uh, mud on uh, the police and on white people for being uh, prejudiced with all this. He says, well, maybe we should have them and that might be a good thing to do. Three days later, they did invite the Dallas police chief and some to speak for them. So they did address that at that point in time, but that was not their intention. And as a matter of fact, we've just seen in the last week, we've seen now the uh, Philadelphia Fraternal Order police chief saying that they are going to endorse Donald Trump still angry at Hillary Clinton. But more importantly, look at what he has to say as he says, when we were deciding who we were going to endorse, he said, we sent them questionnaires and she just blew it off. He said, the Clinton campaign showed absolutely no interest in winning their support. He said they didn't care. Their attitude then back in July during the DNC was that they were going to win this thing anyway. So who cares? He said, now I think the tides have turned a little bit. And she's on her heels. As many times as we've tried to and have a fair process and an open process, the emails back were that they're not interested. And no thanks. Just snide remarks like that, he said. He said, we gave them a very fair process. We thought we put out a questionnaire. And she absolutely refused, outright refused, with a nasty campaign rebuttal as to why she wouldn't. You see what that's about? She's not going to even fill out their questionnaire to even say how the police could be improved. Yeah, they can be improved. There's no organization that is perfect. And in any organization, you're always going to have individuals that do the wrong thing. You're going to have violent cops. You're going to have crooked cops. The question is, will the system take those cops out? That's what we need to look at. And there need to be some reforms of the police. Any organization can be reformed, can be improved. She has no solution for that. She's not even interested in talking about that. She wants that to be maintained just as she wants to maintain the situation in Syria. Why? Because it creates chaos that they can exploit. That's what's fundamentally behind this. Look at their reluctance to call the bombing in New York City terrorism. Today we had Ahmad Khan Rahami charged in New York. What was he charged with? He was charged with bombing, property destruction, use of weapons of mass destruction, but interestingly, not charged with terrorism. Now, why is that? Well, they say that it's because they couldn't link him to a terrorist group, even though he had a jihadi journal, even though he had written down uh, a, a journal of why he was doing this, terrorist motivations. They say, well, we couldn't link him to a group. And yet every time we see a terrorist attack or a, uh, an attack of, of, of uh, a mass shooting, it is always a lone individual, a lone wolf, a lone terrorist. Yet they won't call it terrorism because it's Islamic terrorism. We've gone from a situation where Hillary and Obama can't use the words Islamic terror to where the FBI refuses to use it. Just as they gave this guy a pass in the same way that they gave Hillary Clinton a pass saying she didn't really intend to uh, lose those emails. No, she did. She smashed devices she had her IT guy on Reddit looking to see how he could do it and using an industrial strength eraser, not just deleting the files, but 
erasing every shred of it with bleach bit. At the same time, the FBI is playing these kind of games. They're clowning around with terrorism, charging teenagers who talk in a, in a hoax and a joke kind of way on Facebook about using clowns to kidnap and abduct people. They charge them with terroristic threats. Meanwhile, as we look at the election and we look at the Federal Reserve, we see that Donald Trump is criticizing Janet Yellen because today she came out and said, no, we're not going to raise interest rates. That is a boost to Hillary Clinton. If they were to raise interest rates, if the stock market were to take a dive, of course, that would reflect poorly on Hillary Clinton, who is a continuation of Obama's policies. And if we remember, it was Andrea Mitchell's husband, Alan Greenspan, head of the Federal Reserve, who manipulated interest rates to help Bill Clinton get elected. Yet, uh, she tells people, I can say, this is Janet Yellen saying, I can say emphatically that partisan politics play no role in our decisions about the appropriate stance of monetary policy. Donald Trump says, no, her choices are obviously political. Look, folks, this is a, f a private organization, and as we pointed out before, the guy that owns Chobani Greek Yogurt is sitting on the Fed board even though he's not an American citizen, making policy decisions. And of course, he is a big open border guy. And the sister organization to the Federal Reserve, the IRS, as we see today, there is a hearing going on today in Congress as to whether or not the sitting chief will be impeached. This is another organization that has deleted records of what they did, attacking people politically. Nixon was impeached for this, but today, we can't even fire any of the minions who do this type of work. That is the state of America today. Now, stay with us when we come back from break. We've got a report from John Bowne. He's going to look at more detail as to what Barack Obama said today at the U.N. Are you voting for your party's nominee, Governor? I am. I am. I am proud of Hillary Clinton. I think she's been a, a very good secretary of state, a very good senator from the state of New York. The thing I like most about her is I believe that she is steady. I believe that she is strong. Uh, I believe that she is honest. Uh, and I look forward to voting for her. The speeches are so short, though. They don't last long. You know, they're like 10 minutes. Let's get out of here. Go back home and go to sleep. While Hillary slept, the sleeping giant was awakening, presenting himself in a downpour in front of a hearty crowd of Trump supporters in historic Williamsburg, Virginia. Republican vice presidential candidate Mike Pence delivered a rousing patriotic speech. But you know, it's not just it's not just weakness on the world stage. But Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton are all wet on the economy, too. And the truth is, men and women, as we stand here in Virginia, we hear sunny stories all the time coming from the other side about how good things are. But the truth of the matter is, the American people know different. We're in the midst of the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression. We're in the midst of, the, of an economy that has the lowest labor participation rate since the 1970s. And today, in this economy, there are nearly 7 million more Americans living in poverty than the day that Barack Obama became president of the United States. Hillary Clinton's solution is very simple. More of the same. More taxes. More regulation. More Obamacare. And more of the war on coal that's been stifling American jobs in the American economy. Democratic vice presidential nominee Tim Kaine was catering to an entirely different audience. Hola, Piolín. Soy el senador Tim Kaine, tu candidato a la vicepresidencia junto a mi amiga Hillary Clinton. Kaine was flexing Spanish-speaking skills he had utilized back in the 1980s when Kaine traveled to Honduras to cut his teeth on the wielding of Marxist-based liberation theology. The Hill wrote, Reports indicate that in Honduras, Mr. Kane embraced an interpretation of the gospel known as liberation theology. This wasn't mainstream Catholic thought at the time. It was a radical Marxist-based ideology at odds with the church, the Pope, and the United States, but supportive of and supported by the Soviet Union. Pence and Kane will face off in a vice presidential debate on Tuesday, October 4th. Do you feel bad for Mike Pence that he has to defend, like, I, I, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, because he's got to be constantly like, oh, no, what do I yeah, say now? Like, yeah. what like, what did he say now? Yeah, no, I, it, it is it is part of the role. 
I don't find that a heavy lift at all to, yeah. do, to do the work I have to do to tell people Hillary's story. Meanwhile, Tim Kaine, Chelsea Clinton, and Bill Clinton all fill in for a clearly sick Hillary who managed to schedule a rally in Orlando, Florida at the last minute after being heavily criticized for her absence to the campaign trail before the big showdown between Hillary and Donald on Monday, September 26th. Three days later, she gets up and she does another one and goes back home and goes to sleep. Oh boy, is ISIS hoping for her. Meanwhile, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump continues to steam through Toledo, Ohio, Chester Township, Pennsylvania, and Roanoke, Virginia before the big event. A conservative leader wrote the Gateway Pundit Wednesday morning to share this news, hearing smart guys say that Hillary may cancel the debate on Monday. Hillary may be trying to run out the clock because she thinks she is ahead, or she may be exhausted and scared of another physical emergency. If Hillary manages to not cancel Monday's debate, she now has a full four days off to set up a defense for the onslaught of questions she will have to answer to concerning her long criminal history. I mean, many in the national media spend more time talking about what Donald Trump said in the last 30 minutes than they do talking about what the Clintons have been up to for the last 30 years. But the American people are on to them. John Bound for Infowars.com. This is breaking news. The Texas governor is taking on Obama and his refugee invasion. I'm Ashley Beckford reporting for Infowars.com. I'm here at the Texas State Capitol and I'm here to tell you about the governor issuing a press release just this morning outlining how he will not comply with the federal government's refugee resettlement program. Here on the governor's website, Governor Abbott's statement on Texas intention to withdraw from from refugee resettlement program. The decision comes after requests by Texas for the federal government to ensure refugees pose no security threat. Most Americans know that our borders are wide open. The Border Patrol here in the state of Texas have informed us that people could be coming from Europe, they could be coming from the Middle East, not just from Latin America, and we need to vet these people to know who they are, where they're coming from, and what their intentions are. When candidates say we want to admit three-year-old orphans, that's political posturing. The problem is, is that Obama lied. Obama is saying that most of these people coming over, these refugees, he calls them, are mostly women and children. But that's a flat-out lie. They're 70 percent men. We talked to some people to find out what they think about Governor Greg Abbott taking on Obama and his refugee invasion. Let's find out. If, you, if, if he's for Trump, he's nuts. I don't know. I mean, I'm 18. I don't really know, man. I don't have a problem with it. I think that's the right thing to do at this time. Why do you think that's the right thing to do? Well, because it can't be vetted. I believe Germany has to go the, the, the same way, because otherwise we are in the same trouble like France. They didn't include us, so we see now that they have lots of problems with the people that come, came there, and we're not included in the society. So yes, Germany should totally do also include everyone that comes there. Vetting them for two years, uh, the ones that are coming in now. Okay. And, uh, you know, you building walls and whatever else crazy crap that guy's talking about uh, is not good for this country. I mean, it'd be good just if they need help to come to America, because, I mean, we have opportunity and stuff, right? America, pretty great. There, it's a uh, large percentage of fighting age men who we don't know what their ideas and intentions are they're really included and really get to learn the language and everything, I think it's the right way to do because that is what Germany also should do. But if they just are resettled here and then have their own communities and not being actually involved in the whole community, then it's not the right uh, way to go. Because then there are the splitting groups and more terrorism and stuff like that. So if, they, if Obama really wants to go this way, he should really see that the people are involved, learn the language, learn the culture and everything. The main thing for coming to America is to become Americans, not be uh, whatever nationality and, you know, have their own little section. That's, we, we need to be one country and united. So that's why we're the United States of America. Uh, that's Texas, and like I said, I'm not from Texas, so you, you all do what you all want to do, I guess, but... Uh, 
not, not me. <laughs> Governor Abbott is no stranger to fighting against an authoritarian central government. In fact, he's actually restructuring and reinforcing our liberties and our securities here in the state of Texas, just as the Capitol building itself is being reinforced. The fact of the matter is that more states need to stand up. More people need to get on the bandwagon of protecting themselves and protecting their own interests because we can't depend on this captured federal government to do it for us. This is Ashley Beckford reporting for Infowars.com. Stay tuned for more special reports. Owen Schroyer from Infowars.com, and I'm joined by Margaret Howell, and we're here discussing Internet freedom and who has control over the Internet. Now, this is an issue that is not being talked about too much, and I think that there's a lot of foggy area in this, so we're going to try to get through some of that fog and see what the real issues here are, but... Before we go into this, it's worth pointing out that back in June, on the 8th and the 9th, there were two bills proposed to Congress, one in Congress um, and one in the Senate, excuse me, and one in the House, and you're seeing those bills right now, and they are directly towards the Commerce Department of Government, one started by Ted Cruz, one started by Sean Duffy, and both say they want to protect Internet freedom. So, so what does that mean? What is the protection of internet freedom? Who's going to take over the internet? I bring in Margaret Howell now. Margaret, what what are the issues here? Who's trying to take over the internet, and why are we trying to protect its freedom? Well, as you pointed out to me earlier today, Owen, on C-SPAN, and we've we've suffered through it and watched it for you, the droning on to catch snippets of truth from them. And what we saw today was this one Republican Wisconsin congressman, Jim Sensenbrenner. I doubt you've ever even heard of him. I hadn't prior to today, but he's on the floor screaming, you're about to lose your freedom. He lays it out. He says the Department of Commerce is set to finalize a transition that the Obama administration is pushing forward on September the 30th. I'm going to just read you a snippet. I was trying to write down and transcribe what he was screaming on the floor because nobody is getting this. You don't, we don't understand. He's about to hand over control to an international body, a body of people that do not share our values, our ideology, or our love for free speech, mind you. We're talking about countries, of course, ICANN, uh, China and Iran are both in ICANN. So by handing this over to the UN, he's effectively handing over our free speech to China and Iran. And how, how they're doing this, so and so, the U.S., we we currently control our own domain names. So, for example, .mil and .gov, those are government official websites. We have control over those domains. So, what the president is trying to do is give the internet control over to this international body. So, in theory, we can have a major national security crisis on our hands if we've got Iran, for example, controlling the .mil and the .gov, um, those aspects of our internet freedom. Now, free speech is at the core and the, the very heart, the function of the internet. It exists to provide people with free speech and information. We know that there's crap on the internet. All of us have to deal with it and stomach it. But a lot of the time, uh, you know, we see the court of public opinion policing that. We don't see an international body, for example, like China, uh, that would be policing this. And what we found out in this report, the facilities in the event that uh, the internet control is handed over to China, for example, this is what one senator had to say about it. It would be housed, the control would be housed in the same building as the agency responsible for censoring the country's internet. Uh, they've uncovered that I can't. Beijing office is actually located within the same building as the Cyberspace Administration of China, which is the central agency within the Chinese government censorship regime. So we're, we're handing over control, for example, to Iran because apparently our president didn't give them enough money. He hasn't, he hasn't bought them off a nut. We have got to actually give them the entire lock, stock, and barrel. Every, let's give them our free speech as well. And unless they stop this, this is going to take place next week. We have this little know-nothing congressman on the floor screaming to a blank audience, not a, not a single seat in that audience was filled. And we're here to tell you about it because it's so important. People don't understand. We could have Iran controlling our internet freedom and what we say and do. Oh, and by the way, also our government websites. And I think it's a major issue. It's strange how it's being brushed under the rug, kind of. It's not being talked about too much on the mainstream news networks. And it's a big issue. I think a lot of people would really react uh, emotionally to thinking that their internet freedom might be taken away, considering how much time you spend on there, considering how much social interaction goes on there, um, considering how much people rely on it uh, just for their everyday lives. So this is something that I think could 
get a lot of momentum if people knew it was going on. But the problem is there are other issues going on, obviously, you know, and terror attacks and, and, and racial strife and all that. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, I think, is what's burying this debate. But, you know, it, it appears to me that this is more of Barack Obama siphoning away power from the United States towards an international power structure. And that seems to be what's going on, as you just illustrated. And it's, we're right on the heels of it. That's exactly what's happening, Owen. And it's infuriating to me. You know, this gets me so fired up because what they've done, they've tried to make it too smart for you. You're not supposed to be able to understand it or question it because it's just way over your head. But we're here to break it down for you. And basically, in theory, uh, the only thing that could stop this would be Congress suing if this administration is successful in pushing it through because it transfers power. Now, they're saying it's not necessarily illegal, but this is one of his final pushes before he leaves office. This is what was being reiterated to a blank audience, um, an empty audience on the Hill today. So he, he's saying this, and I want to continue on. The administration, meaning Obama, has expressed a desire to finish it before he leaves office. And currently, we have this multi-stakeholder model, uh, lots, of, lots of shareholders of the power of the Internet right now. And our own country controls what we say and do. Well, that would be no more under this. Plain and simply put, ICANN would control it, the UN would control it, and uh, regimes that do not share our love or passion for free speech would then be able to censor it and also create national security risks because they would have control over U.S. domain names, even government U.S. domain names. And there's a contract right now that deems the current control of the Internet a legal monopolist mm -hmm. because it has in, instrumentally uh, functions of government. And I can see this in the future, Barack Obama using that phrase, monopoly, as an attack on the current control of the Internet. And before he does that, I want to point out, Barack, that your health care system has created a monopoly in many states. So it's funny how you'll be anti-monopoly on the Internet, but not on health care. But we'll see if he plays um, that angle. You know, and you talked about all the fog and all the confusion about this, Margaret. Just like Obamacare. Let me, let's break it down for you. I'm sorry for cutting you off, but that was such an excellent point. Obamacare, let's see what it did. It raises your taxes, you're fine now on your IRS form, and you can no longer afford health insurance. That's all it did. And we We've seen what he does when he muddles up things. We don't need to see this pass. I'm sorry for cutting you off. Please continue. But you're, you made an excellent well, point, that analogy with Obama. And I think that, and that's a good point, too. When you talk about how health care has gotten more expensive, it's actually gotten harder for some people. Uh, there was a point in time where you could try to get it, and the, the servers were so bogged down, you couldn't even get in. And then you end up paying a penalty for that. That's the same type of thing I think we could see if we have this, instrument, uh, this instrumental change in Internet. But, you know, we talk about some of the fog, and I think this illustrates it. Americans for Limited Government received a response to its FOIA Act and a, a request for all records relating to legal and policy analysis concerning antitrust issues for the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN. And the response they got was there was a con uh, conducted a thorough search for responsive records within its possession and control and found no records responsive to your request. So it's like. I mean, what are we what are we really dealing with here? As you said, there's a lot of confusion. I think this will go over the heads of most Americans. I'll be perfectly honest. It's tough for me, someone who's obsessed with this stuff every day, to completely grasp what's going on here. But I think it's very important that we try to figure out what's going on. We as Americans stand up for our right to free speech on the Internet, and we need to know how that might be siphoned off, siphoned off if we hand control over to a U.N. Uh, agreement, which is where it looks like it's going. That's absolutely where it's going. So I mentioned that Congress could, in fact, sue to keep this from happening, and I encourage you, if you, uh, if you are so inclined, please contact your member of Congress because they have a certain amount of power over this still. And in the event that the, the Obama administration pushes this through, Congress can pass legislation to prohibit federal gover the federal government from using your tax money to allow the transition so they can halt it with the power of the purse. That's one way of, of stopping this by not allowing Obama to federally fund it with your tax money. Uh, there, there's a coalition of 25 advocates groups, including Americans for Tax Reform, uh, Heritage Action. They sent a letter to Congress making this exact point. And uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, these last-ditch 
efforts from people like this Wisconsin congressman to get on the floor to an empty audience and say, hey, look, this is about to happen. We have to stop it. He's screaming. We're screaming on his behalf for him. Oh, and, and people need to understand that the way to stop this, there's a push that's happening. It's going to it's set to happen next week if Congress doesn't intervene. It's, it's plain and simple. And Ted Cruz is one of the leaders of this right now. We've been hard on Ted in the past, but I have to salute uh, Ted for his effort right now to keep Internet freedom in America, at least with the uh, bills that he's sponsored. So as you just highlighted, Margaret, we've seen some of the political actions that are being taken. I'm curious, when are we going to start seeing social actions? Are we ever going to see the American people speak out about this? You know, we live in a very polarized environment right now in this country, but I think this is something that all Americans can find common ground on. Of all ages, of all races, of all creeds, of all colors, we can find common ground in the fact that we want internet freedom. We want our internet to stay the same, and we want control over it because we have a passion for free speech. Margaret, thank Thank you so much. Thank everyone out there for tuning into the nightly news tonight. Be sure to tune in tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Central.